This idea of being a new creation and being and, and our true identity is absolutely critical, right? When Paul says that we're a new creation, he's not only talking about us as humans. He's talking about the work God is doing in the world, that we are part of the new creation. Not in a sense God's doing a new thing. He's just saying that what he originally intended to happen in Genesis is happening. Jesus came to this earth to say God's plan is still in place. He is still king of the universe. And I've come to announce this. And he's, he, all throughout the gospels, Jesus talks about his kingdom. And God, Jesus is calling his uh, people to live out their lives according to the king and his kingdom ways. And understanding at the very basis of that is this identity. For us as human beings living today, it's a new identity because back in Genesis 3, the original identity was distorted and destroyed by the work of the evil one in Adam and Eve. But Christ came to redeem and restore that original identity and give us back this birthright to be the children of God. And until we fully understand who we are, it's really hard to be who we are. Until we understand our identity, it's really hard to live out of the fullness of that identity. So we want to start at that really fundamental foundational truth of who we are. Because when we understand that, our life will look different, certainly from those around us who have not been awakened to that new identity through Christ. Uh, we, as a family, had a parrot, right? You're going to get a picture so you understand what I'm talking about. One time I give this message and everybody sort of thought of, I was talking about the Johnny Depp type of pirate uh, because of my accent. <laughs> In case you haven't noticed to this point, I'm not from these parts. Anybody guess where I'm from? Who said Belfast? I, I'm not from Belfast, by the way, but really close. I'm from, uh, I studied in Belfast, as did my wife. Grew up just south of Belfast, studied in Belfast, and then moved to another town. But from Northern Ireland, which the Northern is really important in that statement, just in case you follow. But you, most of you are involved in some way, maybe in politics, so you understand the significance of that. Anyway, parrot, parrot, squirrel. Um, we had a parrot named Rudy. We were given this parrot. Uh, Rudy was a bit of a character. Actually, this is not Rudy. This here is Rudy. Uh, because there's something unique about Rudy I'm going to tell you about in a second. Uh, but Rudy was hand-raised by a lady from North Carolina. Anybody from North Carolina here before I go any further? I don't want to offend anybody. No? I, that was sort of like a half. I have no idea if you just like North Carolina or you're from it. But anyway, so this, this lady hand-raised Rudy. So that means from a little chick, the only influence he had in his life was a human, not a, another parrot, not a mom or dad parrot to sort of show him how to do life. And so two things that, that were really quite unique about Rudy. One is he spoke or he talked like a lady from North Carolina, which was rather hilarious in a house full of Irish people. Uh, you had this green thing in the corner screaming at the top of his lungs. Uh, not obscenities, but, but, but things like, especially when the kids, she was a grandmother, so when the kids, when uh, my son and daughter, which much, who were much younger then, would run around the house, he would scream at the top of his lungs, don't! Do it! <laughs> so obviously, or stop, that was the other thing. So obviously she said this a lot. Anyway, that was one thing about Rudy. There's other things. But the, mo the most important thing I want to share with you this morning that, to make the point is this. That Rudy, being hand-raised by a human from birth, never learned how to fly. He had a human imprint, which although he could talk, he couldn't fly. The very thing that would set him apart from the rest of creation, if you like, was that he would fly. He was given wings to fly above the tree tops. tops. He, he had all the feathers he needed. They were never clipped. He never broke his wings, but yet he couldn't fly because there was at no point in his life that example uh, to fly. And, and at no point did this truth or reality enter his head that, that if I just spread my wings, I could fly. Instead, he would climb down the perch because we never kept him in a cage because he couldn't fly. And he would climb down this perch and he would walk across the floor. And if you've ever seen a parrot, a pirate walking on the floor, <laughs> it's not that pretty because they, they, they weren't designed, they can walk, but their feet are not designed to walk as much as their wings are designed for flying. And this was Rudy's reality. And, and as far as I know, we give him away because he ate furniture and didn't like small boys. And we happened to have a small boy at that time. 
Daniel, who's now a man, but he, he, we had to give him away. But this is how he lived his life. And, and, and it's, it, the reality was that the truth that was missing in Rudy's life caused him to live a life that was less than. And this is true for us as human beings, as people today in this world, when the picture we have of ourselves is missing key truths or contains lies about who we really are, then how we live out our life is incomplete, is diminished, and even distorted from what our Creator intended us for and what He made us for. In fact, here, here's the thing. When, when this distortion comes into our life and, and starts to diminish our view of who we are, starts to, to cause us to think of ourselves as less than we are, what happens is, is that we ourselves personally experience a less than existence. But not only that, the world around us, the community that we live and work amongst, the people, the places, and the spaces we were made to influence and impact. Those places, those spaces, miss out on the beauty and the order and the presence that our Creator intended us to bring into those places. They miss out on the salt that was supposed to be flavoring the places we inhabit. They miss out on the light that our lives were supposed to be shining into those places. Why? because we do not understand who we really are, and therefore we live a less than existence. And so this morning, I want just to focus in on that. And I don't want to give you Andrew's top three points on how that can change. I want to go back to a truth that is unchanging, to a God who we sang about this morning that has the last word. He has the last word. He had the first word, and he'll have the last word. He's the beginning of the story. He's the end of the story. He's the first, and he's the last. He's the sovereign God, the creator of all things. In fact, everything that was created was created by him and for him and is sustained through him. So I want to know who God says I am. I, I don't want to know who the world says I am. I don't want to live in the reality of what my past might say I am or the experiences I have gone through as we heard about this morning because they do not have the last word. They shouldn't have the last word. I want to remind us all this morning of the God who made us, who has the first and the last word. And what does he say? Well, let's go to the beginning of the story. It's a great place to start, isn't it? if we want to understand what the author of the story was intending by the story. Well, let's go to the beginning of the story, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Now, we often read Genesis and we focus on the first verses that come before 26 about creation and, and we recognize God created the world. And then we get to verse 26. We read through it very quickly. There's something in there about we're made in the image of God. So I don't think we look like God, but maybe we have attributes of God. And that's what that means. And we move on and get to Genesis 3 where it says sin entered the world. And that's, in a, many senses, almost the start of our story. But I want to like pause and stay in Genesis 1, 26, 27, and even 28. Because in this is the key to not only our identity, but also our purpose. And I think these are the two foundational questions that humanity have been asking since the beginning of time. Who am I and why do I exist? And today, folks, I can promise you when you leave this building, if you believe the word of God, you will be in no doubt about who you are and why you exist. The pursuit of purpose stops today. We in the West, for some reason, think we have to find our purpose. Nothing that was ever created, nothing, ever got to determine its own purpose. Only the one who created it. And so we will go back and look at what the purpose was for our creation. So let me read Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, remember he had created everything else. Then God said, let us make mankind or humanity in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground, even Rudy. 
that no, wasn't in there. Um, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You will notice in these two verses, something is repeated three times. Let us make mankind in our image. That word image, image of God. And when something in Hebrew is repeated three times, you must see that it's important. They had no way of like doing bold caps in the old Hebrew, right? No way of underlining, no way of highlighting. So to make the reader understand when something was important, they would repeat it three times. And so in the whole of uh, Genesis 1, we see this is one of the most important things. It's repeated three times, that we were made in the image of God. Now, what did that mean to the early readers? When the early readers were reading this uh, piece of scripture, understanding, first of all, that their God created the earth. And I, here, here's the thing, folks, that creation stories were very common back when this was written. Most people who had a God believed their God created the world. This writer's coming along saying, no, this, is, this was not these self-centered gods. This is our God, the God of Israel that created the world. But I believe that actually it's these verses then that are the main point of Genesis 1. Because this was the thing, these verses are the thing that differentiated the God of Israel with all the other gods. Because here's the thing, the, all the other gods ensured or asked for their image, their physical image to be represented in the temples of the day. Our God said, no, there are no images of me in the temple. Why? Because I have made you in my image. And the place for my image is not confined to a building. The place for my image is out there in the world. And we're going to see why in a minute. And, and, and so the writer is saying, hey, first of all, you have been made in the image of God. And this carried with it two important meanings to the early readers that we have somehow missed in the modern era. These are the two important meanings that I want you to get. The first, when, when, when somebody was said to hold the image of God or to bear the image of God, it, first of all, spoke about their identity. And, and this was a title in those days that was reserved for one group of people and one group of people alone, and that was royalty in the day. So the kings and the queens and their families, the pharaohs, if you like, were known as the image bearers of God, nobody else. They were the only ones that carried this title. So when the early readers saw this th this this. Uh, caption or these set of words made in the image of God, immediately they would think, no, but that's Pharaoh. He's made in the image of God. But the writer's saying, no, 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 no. All of humanity is in the image of God. This was mind-blowing to the first readers because the writer is saying that God not only made a few people in his image, he made all of humanity in his image. And with that came the identity, this, this first meaning of the term image of God. It meant this that you were a son or a daughter of God. An identity that was reserved for the pharaohs of the day and their families. No longer would this people look at them and say, oh, they're the sons. They have the privilege of this relationship with God. Now they were being told, no, you have the privilege of this relationship with God. You are God's son and daughter. And folks, this changed everything. Because in the ancient Near East, in that part of the world in those days, and even to this day, it mattered who your father was. You, people were known as the son or daughter of their father. And if your father was an important person, then you carried a certain degree of importance. If your father was a powerful person, you carried with it, you carried with you a certain degree of power. And so they were hearing, your father is the king of the universe. He's the creator of the whole world. Think of the provision and the protection and the power that came with bearing that name of being a son and daughter. And right here in Genesis 1, Right at the beginning of the story, the, the author is laying this out on behalf of God and saying, God has made you to be his son, to be his daughter. You carry his identity. Now, we know when we get to Genesis 3 that Satan tried to come in and destroy and distort the image of God in humanity. But God relentlessly pursued that relationship, even though it had been broken by man. He relentlessly pursued it. All throughout the Bible, we see this love story of God seeking a people for himself who would bear his name and represent him on the planet. And then Jesus came. 
and announce that God's plan is still in place. I've come to seek and to save. I've come to restore what was originally planned. I've come to reconcile all things back to God. So our relationship with God is restored. And that's what Paul says over in Ephesians 1. Paul says this in Ephesians 1, 4, even before God made the world. So Paul's taking us out of time into eternity. Before God even put the world together, he said this, that God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance, listen, to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Christ. In other words, right back then, before time began, God decided that he wanted us as his children. And even though Satan tried to destroy and distort, and even though circumstances in your life has tried to distort that image of God in you, God still looks at you and says, you're my child, you're my son, you're my daughter. And I have sent Jesus into the world to prove it. And through his death and through his re- resurrection, all things are being made new. And when I look at you, I see that you're my child because of what Jesus has done in your life. The original intent of God for you to be his child is now back in play. That is accessed only through Christ. So when we come to this question of life about who we are, we answer the question, we are the children of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. And, and, and that removes any, should remove, if we can live in that reality, should remove any doubt in our minds, am I worthy to be used by God? Am I worthy to live out my life for God? The answer comes back as a resounding yes. You have been made worthy by your creator through Christ. But this image bearer title comes with a why. So our who comes with a why. Image bearer not only meant, if you were made in the image of God, it not only meant that you were a son or daughter of God, it also meant that you represent, you represented God on the, on the earth. That the Pharaoh was the only one who truly represented God. He was the one that ruled the world on behalf of God. And if you read your Bible, they weren't that great at it, Right? So sometimes when we think of ruling, we think, I'm not so sure I want to do that. But that's not the ruling that God was, was thinking about. God was thinking of the ruling on behalf of him according to his good and righteous ways. But this is the meaning that the image bearer of God came with, that you represented God on the planet. And the early readers were reading this for the first time. It's not just Pharaoh. It's me. It's us. We get to represent God on the planet. Yes, Because you're an image bearer of God. And that's the meaning of the term. Not only are you a son or daughter, because of that, you get to be his representative in all of your life and in every space that God has placed you. And, and, and he goes on, the, the writer of, of Genesis goes on to, to make this clear in verse uh, 26. It says that, uh, so that they may rule. So not only in the title do we get the idea we get to represent God, he says, well, actually, because you're an image bearer, you you get to rule the world. Not like rule the world, but rule in the world, although some of us might like that. We get to represent God in the world. So what does this mean? What, What does this mean that we get to rule or we get to represent God in the world? It means that when we step, when we live our lives, that everything we do should be a representative of her father. Because that's what it was to be a son or a daughter of, of someone in the olden, olden days. You, you represented them in life. We get to represent God. So when we go to work, we're representing God. When we live in our neighborhood, we get to represent God. When we go to the gym, we're representing God. We're, we're living our life as a representative of him. And of course, that means that changes the way we live our life that we're not living for our own ends. We're not living according to our own rule book. We're not living according to the way the world says we should live. We're living our life according to what God lays out in his word, his good and righteous ways. That's why Paul says uh, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, and so on. 
In other words, Paul's saying, like, if you truly are a follower of Jesus, wherever you go, people are going to experience love. They're going to experience joy. They're going to experience peace. Why? Because you're representing God, and this is, a rep- this is what God looks like. These are the things that represent God. This is the fruit of having God in your life and focusing your life on him. So image bearer of God, this is the, the who of life. We're children of God. It's the why of life. We're, we get to represent him in the planet. So you want to know what your purpose on the earth is? One thing and one thing alone, which I believe is incredibly freeing. And that is to represent God. So as Paul says, whether you eat or drink, in whatever you do, glorify God, represent God. So if you're working up in Capitol Hill, if you're working in a school, if you're working in a a restaurant, if you're working in an engineering company, in a hospital, wherever you are, represent God. And as you do that, you're fulfilling your purpose on the earth. But what does that look like? That all sounds a little like sort of up there, Andrew, a bit high-level stuff. But what does it look like for me as an individual? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want to keep moving over to Ephesians 2. You know, So in Ephesians 1, Paul is laying out this idea that you remember what was said in Genesis 1, that when God created the earth, he created us as his children to live and represent him. In Genesis 1, we've just looked at those verses that he, he says, yep, were his children through Christ. And down in verse 12 to 14, he talks about, and he did this so that we would be for the praise of his glory. Then he goes over to Ephesians 2 and he says this, Ephesians uh, 2 verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. So quick, that prepared in advance goes back to Ephesians 1.4, that is before he laid the foundations of the earth. That's the advance that Paul is talking about. Before God made us, in fact, before he made the world, he thought of the good work he wanted his people on the earth to do. And then he made them in such a way that they could do it. And he calls it a masterpiece. (laughs) I don't know about you, but that is mind-blowing to me also. That's the forethought that God put in to us as his people. And I believe that's true of the people of God and the people, of, the people out there are going to see the people of God this week through Love DC living this out because part of what Paul's saying in Ephesians 2.10 is that when the people of God live together the way I intended them to do, representing me in all of life, the world will look on and go, hmm, there's something different about that people because the way they love one another, the way they act to one another, the way they love us, you know, this is a little aside that the first 930 didn't get this, so uh, you, you, you're getting this for free. <laughs> um, the early church, so that the church that happened started to grow after Jesus ascended. The early church, it grew from a little handful of people to a group of people that spread throughout the Roman Empire and changed the Roman Empire from being pagan to an empire by AD 300 that said we are now Christian. So an empire that persecuted them for being Christians now saying, you know what? The unifying factor in this nation, this was a little self-centered by the emperor. The unifying factor in our empire are Christians. So we'll become a Christian empire in about 250 years. You know what was the main reason that happened? Some may say, well, Apostle Paul, he was, he was really busy. And a bunch of people like him. No. Historians tell us those that lived in the day and those that have done a lot of study of that day say this, that over 80% of the evangelism of the church growth that happened in those first 300 years was done by everyday followers of Jesus who lived their lives out in the marketplaces and neighborhoods and communities of the world. They weren't well-trained. They weren't seminary grads. They didn't have it all down. They just lived their life representing God. Simply loving their neighbor as themselves. Tertullian, who was a historian from that time, said this. He said, when the pagans, that's his name for unbelievers, I wouldn't advise you to use that to your non-Christian friends, you pagan. Now, that's, that's, a, that's an old word. But he said that when the pagans looked at the Christians and, and, and started to want to follow them, here's, he said they didn't say, read what the Christians write or listen to what the Christians say. They said, look at how the Christians live their life. They love each other. They love 
their neighbor. They love the widows. They love the orphans. It was their life that was an apologetic for their message that could not be argued against. And I wonder in today's world, again, free, free of charge this part, I wonder today if our lives were a little bit more clear, if our lives as Christians in America were a little bit more representative of God than what we're receiving out there from different pockets of our society, if our lives were a little brighter and a little more savorful according to the ways of Jesus, would we not have to shout as loud in the public square? Because our lives are living so loudly that they can't argue against. And this week, you have an opportunity to do this with Love DC, but you have an opportunity on Monday morning in your workplace also. And you have an opportunity in your neighborhood. You have an opportunity in your community. Wherever, like these early believers, they talked about an oikos, wherever their circle of influence was, they lived out their life. And when the opportunity arose, they told people the why behind their what was Jesus and invited them to follow him too. But what does this look like? I think I'd already gotten to that point and somehow you got the freebie. But here's, here's what I want to share. Ephesians 2.10. Paul says, before God made you, he thought of what he wanted you to do and then he made you accordingly. God has uniquely shaped you to live out that purpose which he determined right at, before time to represent him on the planet. He uniquely shaped you to live out your identity as a child of God. He, and he calls it a masterpiece. That acronym SHAPE is, I, I have a whole chapter in my book if you're interested to read more. I borrowed it from somebody else with permission, but it's this here. God has given you spiritual gifts, the S in SHAPE. Spiritual gifts. He's put those inside you through the Holy Spirit when you come to Christ. And that actually in Scripture says that it's more for the body, the gathered body as we build each other up. Wonderful. God has put those inside. Discover what they are. Embrace them and live them out. But secondly, he's also given you passion, heart or passion, the H. Things that you're passionate about. Things that make you really happy and joyful. When you do them, you don't notice the time go, go by, right? Or things that make you really angry because they're wrong in the world. Pay attention to those because those are also from God. Now, you can use those for your own ends, for your own betterment, and even the evil one can try and distort them and use them for his ends. But when they're wrapped around your purpose to represent God and bring him glory, boy, they are powerful. Because when you wrap around your, your, your life around something that you really enjoy doing, look out world. Now, it's probably important to say that the A's critical to the, the H, right? Your ability. As someone once said, like, when, when, when you're good at something and enjoy doing it, that's your strength. When you enjoy something and not so good at it, make that your hobby. Don't, don't impose that in the world, right? That's like golf for me, okay? Or, or music singing. I, like, I can, I'm not going to impose that up here on you, uh, but I'll enjoy doing it. So your abilities, what are the abilities that God has given you? Maybe in, in music, maybe in business, maybe in engineering, or, or maybe in policy writing. This is, this is one of the ones I'm up here. I'm probably among a few. I've met a few already. It's like, you know, these, we need people who are influencing the policies of our day. We still have injustices in this country, right? We still have things that need to be fixed in this country. How will they be fixed according to God's righteous ways if we don't have God's righteous people writing the policies? And part of what we need to be thinking about in this earth, God's mission for our life is not simply to speak a message. God's mission for our life actually has as much to do with bringing his goodness, his righteous ways, his justice, his mercy into every sector of society and every sphere of influence. Whether, again, whether you're a nurse or a doctor, make sure that medicine experiences the righteousness and justice of God. If you're a politician, make sure that sphere, Wh whatever it is, we're living that out. And so understand your ability, link it to a passion that you have, and then pursue it. Now, just a little note on this as well, is that we're not uh, one dimensional. You have many passions and you have many abilities. So you, there's not just one thing, I believe, there's not just one thing out there for you to do. May this free you up from going, God, I'm not so sure of you, what you want me to do. Now, if God tells you, like if you hear on the way home and you see a donkey in the side of the road, you stop and it says something to you, like Balaam had in the Bible, or if you're on your way home and the bush in your front yard starts to burn, but it's not being consumed and God says something to you, 
next plane, okay? Whatever the next, just get on the next plane and go to wherever God tells you to go. And, and I, I'm, I mean that. Like, if God speaks directly and gives you a direct, but I believe the vast majority of instances in the Bible and in life are simply God saying, hey guys, I've given you, I've given you an identity, my child. I've given you a purpose. Represent me wherever you are. I've uniquely shaped you. Now go live that out. And you have freedom in that. So even though your role may change, even though you might not always be a doctor or a leader or a business owner, maybe your business collapsed, you still get to represent God within whatever's next. When you go home at night as a father or a mother or, or into your neighborhood, that, that your purpose never changes, even though your role in life may. And certainly your identity never changes, even though sometimes we wrap our role around our identity and confuse those two. That's why when somebody asks you, who are you? You don't respond with what you do. Even though that's what we do all the time, right? Because when what we do f changes, if it's who we are, we have an identity crisis and we spiral. But when we hold on to this idea, I'm a child of God and no one can take that away because my father has the last word. P, personality. <laughs> We all have different personalities. Pay attention to that. It's critical because there are many jobs out there that will kill an extrovert and there are many jobs out there that will kill an introvert. So pay attention. Even though you're in your passion and you're in your ability, if it doesn't fit your personality, it's going to be really tough and you'll not last. So pay attention to the personality because there's a strength with that personality that you want to bring to the table. E is experience, all the good things, even some of the bad things. God wants to continue to shape your life, your educational experience, your vocational experience, all help shape us into who God wants us to be, is making us to be. We're a work in progress, but God looks at us and says, masterpiece. You are the way I intended you to be. So our role then is to embrace the masterpiece. Do not try to be somebody you're not. And this lie that you can be anything you want to be needs to be flushed out of our mind. I, I always wanted to be a, a play for Liverpool Football Club, for any of you who follow soccer, the best team in the world. Uh, just in case you Google it, it'll tell you that too. Uh, but I, I was never good. And even though I put the hours in, I just wasn't that good. I'm decent, but I'm certainly nowhere near good enough. But I can be everything that God made me to be. My job is to understand what he made me to be. And again, it has many expressions, but I must stay in that because when I live out my shape, <laughs> representing him, not myself, representing him as his child, I am, you are the most brilliant reflection of God on the planet. I have been all over the world, folks, I, I, with my job. Uh, I work for an international Christian mission agency. Uh, and so I get to do that. 85 plus countries. And I've got to see some beautiful sites. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef. The Alps. The Grand Canyon. Amazing. When we as Christians look out over something like that, what is it we say when we're, we're looking out over and we see some amazing natural phenomenon? What's our response? Okay. Wow. What's the thing, this thing we say right after wow? What's that? Somebody said it down here, I think. I heard God is amazing. God made that. Isn't God awesome? Here's the thing. They're only rocks. <laughs> right? And now they're awesome. Absolutely amazing. But you are the children of God. Made to represent him more brilliantly in any of that stuff. Uniquely shaped to do it. And when we don't do it, they'll cry out, the Bible tells us. But we have been uniquely shaped to do this in the most brilliant of ways. So our job is embrace how we've been shaped, focus it on God and his glory, and own the fact that we're on this world to do one thing and one thing only. Represent him. So that the world gets to know who he is. And I love that as that, that verse in, in Genesis 1 goes on to say, it says, God says to his creation, standing in front of him, made in his image as his children, made to represent him on the planet, uniquely shaped to do it in whatever sphere. He, he, needed, he needed farmers, he needed shepherds, he needed builders, he needed teachers, he needed dogs. Uniquely shaped to do all these things. Go out into the world and take it forward. 
as his representatives. I, I love what it says next. He says, now would you go be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth as you rule in it. What was God saying there? He was basically saying, would you go make more who, of who I have made you to be? Children of my children made to represent me, uniquely shaped to it. Would you go and make more? Now, I know there's procreation in that, and I, I'm hearing that this church is doing pretty well. There's about 10 new babies in the last year. Would you, yay, keep going. But it means more than that for us other people. It's like, you no, know, God's saying is, I've made you as my child in my image to represent me. Would you go and make more of who I've made you to be until the whole earth gets to experience the beauty and order that my people bring into every space and every place? That is what God is saying. Now, fast forward a few thousand years and God the Son standing on a hillside just outside Jerusalem and he has his disciples, those that he has spent his time with over the last three years pouring into their life, teaching in this kingdom way that was intended from the beginning now restored through his death and resurrection teaching them how to be his representatives on the earth. He now turns to them and we call it the Great Commission but reality is a re-utterance of what was Genesis, in Genesis 1.28 it's this, would you now go make more of who I've made you to be until every nation in the world has peace people that are fully into my family, my children representing me in every space and place. That is our commission in the world. So Jesus is reminding us of what God said in Genesis 1, now in Matthew 28. It's not a new plan, folks. It's the original plan just restated by the Savior of the world saying, keep going. The whole world needs to be reminded of this. And the people to do it are my followers, which is us. Because that's what they were made for. And so today, folks, we need people to be out there in the world. This, is, this gathering is so important because this is the place you get equipped to go out there and do the work of the ministry. And every sector of society needs people who are following Jesus, representing him, living out loud, bringing good into those spaces, bringing good out of those spaces. And as they do it, the salt is tasted, the light is felt and seen, and people are drawn towards the glory of God to ask the why. Why do you live like this? And could we change? Could we impact? Could we see new creation starting to rise up all throughout this nation? And what about other nations? The three billion in the world that have no one, no one who has gone to live among them to be salt and to be light. Three billion in places like the Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia. And one of the things we're excited about in my space through an initiative we call Scatter Global is to see people going out, not as what we historically called missionaries who quit their job, raise support, join a mission agent, but saying, hey, have you heard doctor? What would it look like to go live as a doctor in Saudi Arabia as a Jesus follower? In your job, bringing excellence to the medical world over there. What would it look like to go as an engineer or as a consultant, as a teacher? as an accountant, to some other part of the world. I just heard from one of our guys who see, oversees our recruiting company. He said, he's just gotten word in from uh, this dentist, uh, dentistry in Ghana is looking for someone from the U.S. specifically with, uh, who is a dentist who can go over there and train a whole new generation of newly qualified dentists to practice at the level we practice over here. They're going to pay the salary. They're going to welcome you in and you get to mentor and coach a whole new generation of dentists and, and also represent God through that. We've jobs in that sense all over the world. The world, you know that uh, around the world, 54% of employers, manpower do this study every year. 54% of employers around the world Places like Japan, the Middle East, cannot find the talent they need. And I say, we have the answer to the world's talent crisis. We have a bunch of Jesus followers who will be your best employees if they're living in their shape and if they're working for God, not just an earthly master, because they're going to bring excellence. They're going to bring goodness. They're going to bring righteousness. They're going to bring justice. Your workplace will change as a result of that. I'm going to finish with two quick stories and then we'll wrap up. Mary uh, was a follower of Jesus. She's actually from another country, but she, uh, not but, and she was a nurse with a little bit of background in education. And she believed everything I was just saying. I met her in a coffee shop in this country in the Middle East a little while back. And she told me I went there to work for God and I wanted to be the best nurse I could possibly be. And in the hospital as she was doing this, her boss soon noticed there's something different about Mary. And she uh, watched how she did her 
nursing and she watched how she interacted with patients and with the families and the other nurses. And they said, pulled Net Mary in. They said, Mary, we've watched you and there's something different about you it's, and it's really excellent. Would you mind like putting a little training program together to train all of our nurses, right? And she said, sure. And she had an educational background, so that's what she did. And she trained all the nurses over the next months. So much so that the nursing care rose to a whole new level of excellence. To the point, the CEO of the hospital started to hear about it. Now, none of these people are Christians, but Mary gets to do this training based on Christian principles. CEO calls her in and said, hey, Mary, I'm, I'm told you're responsible for this. If this is good for the nurses, it's good for the doctors and the specialists. Would you put it together and train the rest of the staff? And she did. The medical care increased in excellence so much so that this hospital system won the Magna Award for Excellence in Medical Care, a international certificate that no other hospital in that region uh, got, had ever received. Why? Because a young woman understood who she was, she understood why she was, and she understood how she was to live out that who and the why according to her shape. She loved nursing. She loved to teach. And she was really good at it. And all of a sudden, order, excellence, started to emerge in a space representing God's kingdom. And people started to ask, Mary, why do you do this? And she was able to say, can I tell you? Can we meet next Wednesday night? Let's talk about the teachings of Jesus. And Mary had these little groups of local people from a completely different religion who were studying the teachings of Jesus and soon became followers of Jesus because of Mary. What would it look like if every one of us stepped into that space, wherever God has us? I could tell you many more stories of hairdressers, of engineers, of techies doing the exact same thing in places like the UAE, Vietnam, Japan, and many doing it in this country. So my challenge is wherever you are, start right here. And even if you're only an intern and you're only here for a short time, wherever you are, that is where God has placed you. So be present, represent him, and point people to Jesus. Final story. I had another bird. This was when I was a teenager. <laughs> His name was Peter. He wasn't a pirate. He was a, what we call a budgie, you call a parakeet. This was Peter. Well, a little bit like Peter. He looked exactly like this. Peter's long gone. And let me tell you the end of the story. And you'll know what, it mean, what this means when I get there. He didn't come back. He probably got eaten by a cat or something. But anyway, Peter was given to me when I was just in my team. I always loved animals. And, and, and he was given to me by someone who bred and showed budgies. Uh, but Peter had a pigeon chest, which budgies shouldn't have, I'm told. Uh, and I'll not go into the details, but it meant I got him for free. And so Peter became my good buddy when I was growing up through my teenage years, which is a little sad in and of itself. But anyway, he would, I would take him around the house on my shoulder. We, I would talk to him. One day I came home from school and as usual, took him out of the cage, put him on my shoulder. We went upstairs. One important piece of information about Peter was I thought he couldn't fly either because he had this pigeon chest and, and, and every time he would fly one lap around our living room or whatever room he was in, there were really small rooms back over there, he would just land on the floor or maybe sometimes grab onto the curtain and his wings were out flapping, his beak open, flapping and gasping for air. So I was convinced Peter couldn't fly. There was something wrong with him. <laughs> so anyway, this day he was upstairs with me and he heard a noise down the living room, which was my mom. Uh, and so he decided he was going to go down and see my mom. So he flew down the hallway, took a 180 degree turn, and then gl glided down the stairs. And the bottom of the stairs, uh, the living room was a sharp left turn. The front door was straight on. The front door was open. So Peter didn't take the left turn. He went straight out through the door uh, and outside. And I could hear this shriek from the living room from my mom saying, Peter's gone or Peter's out, which was the thing we always worried about. So I ran down the stairs, full pelt. Halfway down the stairs, this thought came to my mind. Peter can't fly. He's out in the front yard, gasping for air with his wings out. So I slowed down, walked out to the front yard, looked around for little yellow Pete to see where he was. There was no sign of Peter. Then I looked up at the sky. And then there was this, there was this little yellow dot soaring around like an eagle. My first thought, in full 
uh, transparency was, you dirty rat, you can't fly. <laughs> and then I realized the problem with Peter actually was not Peter. The problem was with Peter was that he had been confined to a little world, a little box that caused him not to be able to express who he really was, to not be able to live out who he really was. And so he was constantly trapped, confined, exhausted. But when he stepped into the spaces and places where he was created to live, he found a freedom. And here's the thing, folks. When we live out who we are in the spaces and places we were created for, doctors, engineers, nurses, politicians, whatever it is, not only do we personally experience the greatest amount of freedom, the not the less than life, but the more than life, the abundance of life. But not only that happens, but also the world around us, the community we live and work in, the places and spaces and, and people we were made to influence and impact, they get to experience the beauty, the order, the excellence, the goodness of God through us. They get to taste the salt that we were told to be. They get to see the light that we were made to shine. And Jesus said, when we shine that light, they will see that good work and they will honor God. And that is what we were made for. My prayer for us today is that every person in this room, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you will understand that your true identity can be fully grasped and lived out when you step into and towards Jesus and accept him. And those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have an identity that's unchanging. We have a purpose that's unshakable. And we've been shaped as a masterpiece to live it brightly in the world. So whoever you are, wherever you are, live it out. And as you think of your future, consider where in the world could I go where no one has shown up yet to be salt and to be light so that they too can know about Jesus.